the sharing economy. Everybody seems so excited about the sharing economy. Some people are feeling a little depressed about the sharing economy, and I think I'm starting to be one of those depressed people. So it's a Friday afternoon. I'm going to make a cartoon about the sharing economy, and uh, it's not the most polished piece in the world, but I think it's really important to just call attention to how the sharing economy has really forgotten about the sharing piece and how we can change it. Hopefully this will be a hopeful message. But, I mean, here's the thing about the sharing economy. We've all heard about Airbnb and Lyft and Uber and TaskRabbit and all of these these platforms uh, that are web-based and that they do a lot of really powerful things. They're opening doors for people. Um, they're enabling, for example, somebody who needs a ride to connect with somebody else who happens to be going to the same place and uh, magically meet up with them and connect with them and get a ride. And, and in some cases, the driver makes money. Other cases, no. But either way, this, is, this stuff is pretty powerful because it has never really been possible before. Um, and it's changing transportation and a lot of wonderful things. And, you know, the sharing economy is also making it possible for complete strangers on one side of the world to meet people on the other side of the world and stay in their homes. And um, one really powerful thing about all of this is that it's redirecting some money, the flow of money in the world in some ways. A person with a car has an opportunity to make a new kind of livelihood, and, um, you know, people are paying money to each other and consuming and producing in new ways and that that alone is a really powerful thing but if you look behind the scenes and you look at the inner workings of the companies that own and manage the platforms of the so-called sharing economy you find at least two fatal design flaws one of those design flaws is that the companies are owned by shareholders who are the people who put up the capital for the company and the company is basically designed to create a flow of profits to those shareholders and the companies actually generate right now they're generating a lot of profits for those shareholders and um, but one major problem with doing that is that we live in a society where in the United States 20 percent of people control 93 percent of the wealth that's almost all of the wealth controlled by a relatively small sector of society and if you look at the other side of that equation, it means 80% of people in the U.S. are basically getting by by sharing 7% of the wealth. And it's and when I say wealth, it's not just money. It's the land on which we live and make our livelihoods. It's the water that we depend on for life. It's, it's the homes in which we live and the buildings and the factories and the other uh, means of production and consumption. And this is all incredibly important infrastructure. And it is really bad that wealth inequality has has gotten to this extreme place. And wealth inequality, you know, it's not just that it's unfair and creates social instability, it also accelerates climate change, which everybody really needs to be worried about right now, whether they're rich or poor, because when people don't have a lot of money, they buy cheaper goods, um, they buy the cheapest foods, the cheapest fuel, and all of that relies on extracting and then burning fossil fuels and burning and burning and burning them to the point that we're simply not going to be able to sustain this. Um, so that's the first flaw. The second flaw is who is behind the wheel of the company? Who is steering and directing the company? Well, it's usually a board of directors, and that board of directors receives direct instructions from the shareholders, the shareholders who elect them. And because of that, even if somebody starts a sharing economy company with wonderful intentions, I mean, there are a lot of wonderful people who have started incredible platforms, and maybe they've even structured them as B corporations or benefit corporations, built-in social and environmental goals. As soon as those companies take the big venture capital money, there is always going to be a voice in their head telling them how to maximize profits for the shareholders. And the voice in the head or the shareholders, is going to urge the company to do things that is going to increase the margins, you know, market to wealthier people, raise the fees, sell private information, things that are going to earn more profits, but not necessarily provide social or environmental benefits, not necessarily benefit the actual users and the stakeholders of those platforms. And so I think that a lot of people are starting to wonder especially the users of these platforms, especially people making their livelihoods through the platforms, is this a really amazing, innovative technology that we should be really excited about? Or is this a huge ship 
into which the users are basically shoveling coal, they're shoveling their money, they're shoveling their time, their energy, their resources, when ultimately this is a system that is going to go down. And when it goes down, it's going to take a lot of people first. There's definitely going to be some people who are there high and dry, but ultimately it's going to go down and take all of us. So, so we, need, we need a next sharing economy. We need to do something different. And the next sharing economy needs to build sharing in to the core of the companies in at least six ways. And, you know, we're going to continue to build these platforms that enable people to engage in micro-enterprise and to provide for one another in these unique ways, but we're not going to design the platform to generate wealth for the people in society who already have enough money. We're going to leave the money in the company there for a minute while I explain what's going to happen with it based on uh, who controls the company and so on. So the very first type of sharing, sharing control, uh, sharing control of the company, preferably with the users, and especially the users who are dependent on those platforms for their livelihoods. They are the ones who should largely control the companies by electing the board of directors on a democratic basis. And if they do that, then the board is directly accountable to those users, those service providers or freelancers, whatever you want to call them. And that means the board is going to make decisions that benefit their livelihoods. So they're going to steer the company in directions that, for example, ensure good working conditions and that keep fees low and that diversify membership because it's not like somebody, as you'll see in a minute, is going to get rich just because you have wealthy users. So another thing that companies can do and should sometimes consider is whether to give control to multiple stakeholders. So in this case, in the example of this company, maybe you want to give some power to the passengers and give them a voice in electing the board. And if you do that, then the board is also going to be making decisions that ensure that people can meet their vital transportation needs, that the, the drivers go to low-income neighborhoods, and that the fees are affordable, and that the riders are safe, and so on. And since these companies exist on the planet Earth and in a society that has a lot of problems that are going to affect all of us, the second kind of sharing is sharing responsibility for the common good. And right now, um, a lot of governments, especially a lot of cities, are really upset because there are these new companies who are undermining the city's ability to manage the common good and to balance the interests of a lot of stakeholders. Cities are really concerned with ensuring that there is an adequate supply of affordable housing and short-term rentals affects that. The cities are concerned with how taxi drivers drive, what types of vehicles they drive, you know, ensuring low emissions, uh, ensuring stable livelihoods for taxi drivers. And so if we're creating new companies that want to share responsibility for the common good, we need to be collaborating with governments and balancing in the interests of all the stakeholders that governments are trying to, to take into account. And if we want to serve the common good, we can also give a voice to nonprofits, maybe even giving nonprofits the power to appoint members of the board of directors. And so I'm working with a company right now called Loconomics, loconomics.com, and it's a cooperative corporation. But two out, of the thought, two out of the seven board seats are going to be appointed by nonprofit organizations that are keeping in mind the broader interests of local economies and the rights and stability of freelancers in society. And if we give voice to all of these people, to governments, to nonprofits, to um, the various stakeholders and users of the company, it means that the money that the company earns is going to be spent in a wide variety of ways, but reinvested into the company. Um, maybe purchasing electrical, electric cars for the drivers, purchasing health insurance for the drivers, uh, and doing many things that benefit the broader community. So the third kind of sharing is sharing earnings. So here in this example is one of the service providers receiving an annual dividend. But if you really want to change the way that wealth flows in society, you should give that dividend not on the basis of the money that the users invest in the company, meaning you know, how much money do they have the privilege to invest, but actually how much value or what is the quantity of the services or business that they do with the company. Maybe how many hours did the driver drive or how much income did the driver generate for the company. 
And in that way, you know, basically what you're creating is a cooperative. If you have an organization where the freelance service providers elect the board of directors on a democratic basis and they receive dividends on the basis of their patronage, you could call that a freelancer-owned cooperative. And the word cooperative is uh, a difficult word because a lot of people have associations with cooperatives and this idea that they're inefficient businesses. But cooperatives and their legal DNA at their very core are just two very powerful concepts. Money does not buy power in a cooperative, meaning that the board is elected on a one-member, one-vote basis. And money does not buy profits because profits are distributed on the basis of patronage. So money doesn't rule everything in a cooperative. People rule things in a cooperative. So, of course, a lot of people are asking, well, how are we going to finance these platforms? If we're going to create new platforms for the sharing economy, don't we need to get a bunch of money to start it? Well, one piece of good news is that it is the year 2014, and it's just not that expensive to create a platform anymore. You're not recreating the wheel. Um, you're creating a website, and you're, you're doing so potentially based on a proven model, which a lot of the existing companies have already built for us. So, But let's still imagine you need, say, half a million dollars to get a platform started. Uh, that's where another kind of sharing comes in, sharing and capitalization. And that means crowdfunding. Uh, if you need $500,000, for example, it's not that hard to find a 1,000 people who might each lend $500. Um, and there are three things that are making crowdfunding more possible right now. I mean, one is that technology is connecting people and enabling um, enterprises to connect with a wide variety of potential investors. Uh, the law is changing in the United States to enable crowdfunding. And people just have a growing distaste for conventional stock markets in Wall Street. And people want to take their money out and take their money out of fossil fuels and other awful investments and, and diversify their po portfolio of investments. And they could do so through helping to crowdfund a wide variety of, of new enterprises. So the fifth way of sharing is sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing skills, sharing data, because we'll have a much freer and more innovative and more stable society if we share knowledge. And in order to have a democratic organization, companies also need to be transparent so that they could show their users how they work and allow the users to make informed decisions. Uh, but another piece of the sharing information is sharing the code, sharing the language on which the platforms are built open sourcing it basically because if you do that it enables yet another form of sharing the sixth one sharing efforts because if you share the code uh, you use to design the platform then the users of the platform can join in the efforts to develop the platform improve it add features add apps uh, and just take innovation to new levels because in a sense it you know they will feel like this is their platform they in a sense own the platform too and they will be motivated uh, to engage in, in growing that platform and, and innovating. So another way to put all of this is that the platforms of the sharing economy can be designed as commons. And there's a definition of commons that I really like from David Bollier. Um, and it is he basically says that we can create a commons out of anything. If there is a resource that we manage together collectively, and we do that with a special regard for equitable access and long-term stewardship, that is a commons, and that is how we should be structuring the platforms of the sharing economy. And in the meantime, before these platforms, these new platforms exist, it's okay to continue to shovel a little bit of coal into the old economic system, even though we know that system is sinking, uh, because we need to eat we need to keep a roof over our heads. And so a lot of us use these platforms and everybody participates in this economic system. But we should be doing as much as possible right now to create the new platforms of the sharing economy, to join new cooperatives, and start building a critical mass to make them viable. So as soon as a cooperative emerges to offer the same services as, say, Uber or Airbnb, then the drivers or the hosts should begin immediately posting on the new cooperative platforms and then slowly but surely 
begin moving as much of their business to the cooperative as possible. And here in the graphic is the link, or it's the uh, URL to Loconomics.com, which is structured as a cooperative, and that is a freelancer-owned cooperative through which freelance service providers can often uh, offer their services and um, have customers book time and pay for their services. And that is the kind of platform to which we should all be moving. And we should do that with the knowledge that in the long run, this is what is going to provide for us. This, this new structure is solid, um, and it's going to provide us with livelihoods. It's going to provide us with sustenance. And that is the next sharing economy, and that is a true sharing economy. And the planet and pretty much everybody on it needs us to get on this boat as soon as possible.